Okay, if I can uh, call the meeting to order, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 16th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. We've received apologies from Claire Adamson, the convener, um, Ross Greer and, and Oliver Mundell, and Tavish Scott has indicated that he will be um, late to arrive. Can I remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting? Um, and if we can then move to item one. Um, first item of business is the fifth evidence session on the committee's subject choice inquiry. Today we will hear from local authorities. Can I welcome to this meeting Jerry Lyons, representative of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, Dr Pauline Stephen, Director of Schools and Learning at Angus Council, Tony McDade, Ed Executive Director of Education Resources, South Lanarkshire Council, Dr Mark Ratter, Head of Education Services, Quality Improvement and Performance, East Renfrewshire Council, and Vincent Doherty, Head of Education, Aberdeenshire Council. Um, and obviously to the panel, we don't, you don't have to answer every question, so if you can just indicate, um, I'll, I'll try to uh, call you when you want to respond to a question. And if members and witnesses can uh, keep their comments focused, that means we'll get through the evidence. I think that's really more a warning to me than anybody else in the committee. So, um, if we can, um, th first of all, thank you all for, for being here. And I'm going to ask uh, Jenny Goldruth to open the question. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I want to take you all back in time uh, at the start this morning um, in terms of the, the development of uh, the senior phase and your involvement in it. Now, I know that um, having been a development officer at Education Scotland in around 2012-13, you remember there was a... <clears throat> Excuse me, a commitment uh, secured with ADES to develop core support materials with the government. I think Michael Russell was the Cabinet Secretary at the time. And it was core support material to support National 4, 5 and higher. There was also a, a commitment secured to develop um, professional focus papers, which was about empowering the profession to understand the main exam changes for the new qualifications. But I want to find out this morning what your involvement was in that development of the senior phase and, and what it looked like back, so it would have been around 2012, 2013. What, what was your organisation's respective involvement in that process? From the ADIS perspective, uh, ADIS were involved with stakeholder groups and the, the groups that were having discussions uh, about the development of the curriculum at that particular time. Uh, my understanding is that ADIS was not directly involved in producing materials or developing resources. Uh, Education Scotland would potentially have been the agency that would have been most charged with that responsibility, but ADES was involved in this, the various stakeholder groups that existed at that particular time. Um, at that particular time, I was a head teacher within our local authority, and I remember it, it quite well, um, in the sense that we worked together at, from a school's perspective and a local authority to try to shape some of the information that was coming out nationally, to look at how that would look no locally, um, and to see how that would then translate into practice, because obviously we were looking at the scale the development from S1 right through, not just in terms of the broad general education, but the kinds of qualifications that were coming on stream and what that might look like. So I think it was an involvement as a head teacher and indeed as a local authority trying to look how best that that might look as you were, you were moving. I'll come back to you in a minute. Does anybody else in the panel want to respond from their experience? No? Jerry Lyons? Uh, also as a head teacher at, at the time, one of the interesting discussions that was taking place was the support materials that had been produced as part of Higher Still, you may have been familiar with them, you know, the massive folders for every subject. And there was certainly a decision that, you know, having that bulk of paper and that amount of material prepared would not necessarily be the way forward. And I, I do remember as a head teacher that it was very much about working with teachers to say, like, what is, what's the guidance that we've got? What are the experiences and outcomes saying? What are the course the script are saying, and how do we develop that in a way that's um, of most value to our young people? So it was a different model from that kind of, you know, get a course for everything. And given that whole concept of teacher agency, which is still being talked about now, and letting teachers develop, was was very much my memory of of, of what was happening at that point. Okay, thank you. 
I want to move on now to how the senior phase looks uh, compared to how it perhaps looked five, ten years ago. And Vincent, in your submission, you say that it's, uh, it makes timetabling now much more flexible. Um, and you say that prior to CFE, the S56 timetable catered mainly for the most able, concentrating on ensuring that higher and advanced higher courses could run. Now pupils in the senior phase can access courses at the time most appropriate to them. I wonder if the rest of the panel would agree with that assertion, because perhaps in the past, and certainly when I was at school, pupils were encouraged if they were not deemed to be academic enough to leave school at the end of S4. Would you say that, you know, Vincent's approach to this is, is the right one? I don't know if you want to respond to that yourself, Vincent. Yes, well, and I think firstly I'll say um, probably the words it could be argued that should have, have gone before the S5 and S6. Now, ha having been a head teacher myself um, in uh, Mary Hill um, f f for a number of years, um, I think the point that's been made here is um, that the school that I was responsible for um, had less than 10% of the youngsters in S5 and S6 achieving five hires. And I always would think when we were doing the timetabling exercise, so why do we say a, a timetable starts with five different columns to ensure that the youngsters who are doing five hires can progress clearly through a column structure where they will be able to do five hires and then progress further onwards. So my question was always, what about the other 90% um, of the children? So I guess in the senior phase now, the way that it's oriented, it's a different concept because it's over three different years and children do, young people do mature at different rates and the qualifications available to them over a three year period gives a much greater flexibility and allows a youngster to learn at a stage when they're ready. Now if you take it over that three year span then it does give you a much greater pot if you like to be able to mix about for youngsters, therefore the greater um, timetable and flexibility that I mentioned in that submission. Jerry? Uh, I would support that com completely. The concept of the senior phase that I was trying to take forward and I'm still taking forward was that it's, it's a learner journey for young people and that as far as possible we want to be able to get what we offer as close to young people's needs and aspirations that can possibly be over that three year period and certainly until, until they leave school. And one of the things that I welcomed with Curriculum for Excellence was that I felt it gave the opportunity to meet the needs of groups of young people or individual young people that the previous models didn't give us the chance to meet. And that flexibility that Vincent refers to was one of the drivers for the way certainly I was involved in the, uh, the evolution of the curriculum that let's make sure that what we offer is good for all of our young people and gives them all an opportunity. And there were drivers around that which were the highest level of attainment and achievement by the time they leave school and the most aspirational destination that they can achieve. So we always started with that and then worked our way back. And I think the, the senior phase as it is at the moment gives licence for schools to do that. Do you recognise there there might be a tension then, perhaps, because I, I take Vincent's point about the five column structure being, you know, really suitable for the most able, but actually for kids who weren't able to achieve five hires in one set, sitting, it, it wasn't really meeting their needs. And perhaps there's a tension then between you talked there, Jerry, about the needs of young people and perhaps their parents or wider society, you know, people who are a bit older and have gone through the system and, and maybe haven't recognised that it's changed and there's that natural clash because folk don't understand it's different now. I, I mean, I, I think... I think one of the things we have to continue to do is to get better to tell the story to people who came, you know, who came through, a, as you say, a five-column structure or, or whatever, and, and give them that understanding of what we're trying to do for their children, for their you know, sons and daughters, uh, and that we've got a, a chance to do much more for them than we ever did before, uh, and how we can do that. But, Parental engagement around all of this is, is critical and I was interested in your own engagement with parents and the feeling from some that they didn't quite understand the senior phase. I think we have to take cognizance of that and do everything we possibly can to change that. Well, I, th I think I would agree with, with what, what Jerry's saying there. I mean, it, it is very much about making sure that we've got a senior phase that meets the needs of all our learners. Uh, within East Renfrewshire, we've had that focus on, on raising attainment from before Curriculum for Excellence and through Curriculum for Excellence now, but also 
on that wider, on that breadth of, of opportunity. And I think one of the key changes that we can see is that developing the young workforce focus um, and within our senior phase now, um, that, those partnerships with our colleges and universities and employers giving a far greater choice. So um, if I take one of our high schools, uh, our fifth and sixth years have a choice of over 130 different courses that they can take. Some of those will take place in the school, traditional hires, advanced hires, national five, but alongside that, a huge range of courses from level one to level eight, which they can access in partnership with the colleges. So it provides that opportunity to make sure that we're meeting all the learners' needs. I agree with my colleagues. I think one of our biggest challenges is communicating with parents about all of the options that are available to our young people and helping our young people be in a place where they can go home and explain to their parents what their choices are and what the implications of those choices might be and where they might lead next. And I think there's um, uh, work that perhaps we could do together nationally to look at how we clear up that, make that more accessible for families to understand the range of choices for youngsters. Um, so I think it's something that we benefit from having a closer look at together. Finally, um, on that raising a team point you, you mentioned there, uh, Dr Ratter, um, I guess in the past it was the responsibility of local authorities to look at how they did that at a local level with, for example, QIOs. And we know that those posts have diminished over the years. I mean, what is the responsibility then on regional collaboratives? Is that where you see their role coming in then to provide that challenge and support to the profession? Or does ADES have a take on what that support should look like at a local authority level? Should we go back to the QIO structure? Because I know that under the previous system, we did have a lot of good local expertise. And I guess there is a fear in the profession that that local expertise will be lost um, because we don't have those posts anymore. So is that the responsibility of the RICs to come in and fill that gap? I mean, I can talk about within East Renfrewshire, we still have that, that expectation and that focus that um, the central team, along with our, our head teachers and our schools, have that responsibility to bring about that improvement and to raise the attainment. So I think it's that collaboration that we have where we work very closely with our head teachers, um, whether that's in terms of uh, looking at the curriculum, designing the sort of reviews, looking at attainment. Um, <coughs> and working uh, in response to them. I think the, the collaboratives, the regional improvement collaboratives, certainly as a member of the West Partnership, that is then adding that additional value where we can learn from one another um, and see what's working effectively in other local authorities. I've been working closely with um, uh, Glasgow recently, where a group of secondary head teachers have had the opportunity from East Renfrewshire to work with a group of secondary head teachers in Glasgow to look at learning and teaching and to see about that best practice and how we bring about that improvement. So I think. First and foremost, it still needs to sit with the local authority and then the regional improvement collaboratives adding that value in the system. Yep. Okay. Um, I, th I think it, there is still a need within the local authority to continue to have that degree of support. Again, we would have it centrally, but our, our head teachers definitely see themselves as having a responsibility beyond their own school and trying to look at how they can build and support each other. For, for that improvement perspective. So you have the, I think you have an, an evolving picture with this, where the, the notion of a, a QIO coming out in order to try to simply hold people to account or to support people, I think you need to be more than that. I think that schools themselves, that is the, the whole point of empowerment, where schools take responsibility for that action, are able to work together with the local authority. And now we have the opportunity with the improvement collaboratives to look at scale, to look to genuine, to look at the best practice, to see where there's, there's like for like schools the demographic is similar, and, and to be able to add some capacity to that as well. From the, the Glasgow perspective, and I suppose a local authority perspective, I would reflect that completely. But one of the things that I think was incredibly positive and remains incredibly positive is that networking between schools that is taking place. We were at an event the other day that was run by the Bosch Group which is a group of head teachers who've come together to help move, help each other move forward the curriculum. There are over 200 senior managers there working together to understand how to move the curriculum forward. And certainly, ADES' position around having an empowered system is about that, you know, enabling people to work together and sending a message that your responsibility as a leader spreads out beyond your school. And I think that's been a really positive aspect to it. Within the West Partnership, we certainly see an opportunity there to add value to that. Uh, I think the project that Martin refers to has been really, really successful. Tony and I are, are 
on a group that are looking at how we can bring uh, subject leaders closer together to network more and to learn from each other's practice and likewise primary colleagues to work together but certainly in the senior phase context people coming together to help and work together is a really positive element of our system at the moment and both as from the ADES perspective and I think from the local authority perspective and from the regional improvement collaborative perspective and if you let me I can name 45 other perspectives although I don't think it's helpful the message is it's, we want to be empowered we want people to work together and schools I think are very much in that space Great. thank you Ian Gray I, I just had a small follow-up to Dr Stephen's point um, so y you were talking Dr Stephen about um, pupils but also parents understanding <coughs> the routes the routes potential routes through uh, the different pathways that are available and I mean I suppose at one time um, they did understand the routes because the routes were very similar and consistent right across the country students did standard grades and then if they went on they did hires and if they went on they did advanced hire and that that was kind of well understood um, and what we've got is something much more diverse now with a lot more choices. But you said you thought we could work together nationally to make that better understood. And I, I just wondered what you really mean by that. Do you mean more consistency so that there's a bit more of a consistent model? Or, or what would you work together to do? Thank you. Um, my intention in that statement earlier was not about uh, necessarily consistency, but about um, finding better ways of explaining to people what their choices are and what the implications of them are. So if I give you a practical example, we work with young people at the moment to speak about foundation apprenticeships and how they may open up particular routes to employment that meet with individual children's aspirations about their future career. And it, my own experience would suggest that sometimes when a young person goes home and speaks to family about a foundation apprenticeship, that's something very new. I agree with you and with what's been said earlier that most of us have gone through a system that we could recognise for each other and now it's, it's shifting and it's different. And I think there's an ongoing challenge for us to communicate that, the advantages, the disadvantages of particular choices for individuals. And it is about, in my opinion, individual learner pathways and what's particularly right for a young person because of where they're at now and where they want to get to. It's a course choice booklet, doesn't it? And if the course choices are so complex and diverse that people have trouble navigating them, I'm, I'm not sure what you're suggesting would improve that. Well, there are some very good examples of excellent course choice booklets nationally that we're certainly looking at to improve our, our offer in Angus. And I think it's back to what my colleagues have spoken to before. It's, it's about that sharing. It's about seeing what's out there and what we can learn from each other. OK, thanks. Smith. Uh, thank you. Vener, um, I wonder if I could draw your attention to some of the evidence that we've had presented to us in previous sessions, uh, specifically from the academics and then from uh, the IS, where the point was made uh, quite forcibly, actually, that there is a feeling that there is a disconnect between the BGE and then the senior phase. And in the case of uh, Dr Britton, he went on to argue that as a result of that, he felt that the responsibility for curriculum development and therefore the accountability for it um, was not at all clear, which might be some of the problems encountering uh, the uh, CFE concern at the moment. Could I just ask you to comment on whether you think there is a disconnect between BGE and the senior phase? Okay, uh, there shouldn't be a disconnect between the PG and the senior phase. That's the first thing I would say. And I think there's an iterative element to this, and I think that that disconnect may have been in place maybe three, four, five years ago. But as we are understanding the senior phase better, as schools are engaging with the, the learner journey more effectively that disconnect is starting to get less, I would suggest. And it should be less because one of the design principles for, of Curriculum for Excellence was progression. And what we were charged with planning was a progressive education for young people from three to 18. From my perspective as a secondary head, that was very much, I really kicked into that about 10 to 18. So the curriculum is designed in the schools 
that I worked in and in the schools I engaged with to say that really there should be a progression from first year right the way through the BGE into the senior phase and actually it, sh it should be a six year experience. Um, pick you up on, on that issue. I mean, there are some who would argue very strongly that the um, BGE in terms of uh, languages, in terms of um, the first taste of science subjects, the progression is very weak because there is a huge downturn in the number of uh, young people up taking up the um, modern languages qualifications and in STEM subjects. And they point to the fact that obviously that has concerns for the economy as well as for um, the educational experience. If that is correct, and it's quite clearly correct from the statistics we've got from SQA, is that not a major concern that in some of the core subjects um, in the senior phase, there appears to be quite a squeeze and that could be detrimental to the core curriculum? Would you accept that? No, I, I wouldn't accept that, although I understand where it comes from. If, if I can take modern languages for a second, and because I was coming here today, I took time to check in with some of my modern languages colleagues on this issue. And the message I got, I mean, I think there's one thing that we, that hasn't been said and I think should be said was that modern languages in fourth year in schools and third and fourth year in the standard grade era was compulsory, everyone had to do a modern languages, a modern language. And inevitably when it wasn't compulsory, there was going to be a reduction in young people taking it up. Some of that was also reaction to the, the fact that you could make a decision and take it up and young people quite thought, oh, that's quite good, I can do that now, so I will. However, where it, what I, the feedback I got from my modern languages colleagues was, where we can develop a passion for languages, where we can develop a curriculum where young people see the relevance and the meaning in it and what it can do for them, that's where we have most success. The building of this for modern languages for me starts in primaries. And for me is either secondaries and primaries working together to build the skill set of primary colleagues or finding ways for secondary and primary to collaborate on delivering modern languages better in primaries. And I would suggest also in P5, if I can, if I can do a dad moment for a second, my son studied French in nursery, and he was a much better French speaker in nursery than he had subsequently turned into, as, than he is now. So I think we can grow modern languages. I think there was an inevitable reaction to it not being core anymore. And I think we're now growing it through primary, growing it through learning and teaching in the, uh, in the BGE. And, and one of the schools where I was head that had, had that squeeze that you, that you described. And now we are back to, in that school, higher French, higher Spanish, thriving uh, young people at National 5 and National 4. And that's been about the quality of the curriculum that's been developed in that school in the BGE. Is your point, uh, given, given the statistics, which are pretty dire for modern languages and the uptake for SQA, yep. uh, higher and advanced higher, uh, are you making the point that the uh, senior phases is, is now designed will undo this squeeze somehow? Because, you know, there are other subjects um, that are complaining bitterly about this squeeze as well. And I was listening to the geographers just yesterday. Um, they are very worried that the number of the core curriculum subjects are being squeezed out and that notwithstanding all the benefits of the flexibility, that core uh, is just so important to the breadth of your educational experience um, across the senior phase. Is that not a concern? Because that's one of the very strong pieces of evidence that's coming to us from all quarters. I've seen that evidence and I've, and I've been very interested in that evidence and there were two things that occurred to me about it. The Curriculum for Excellence was designed to give our young people a breadth of learning and a breadth of experience. The BGE was about that breadth. One of the ways that we can deal with some of those concerns from our geography colleagues and our STEM colleagues and, and modern languages in there as well, is continue to challenge schools to raise the bar of the BGE. Because young people will study in every curricular area until the end of S3 my understanding of how we should develop the curriculum. 
we can raise the bar of the BGE so that they, they learn at a level that will meet the needs of society, meet the needs of employers, and meet their needs. QA qualifications, if they have to drop these subjects? If they are motivated enough and if they see the relevance and the meaning of it, they won't drop the subjects. But they, but and they that's can't in some really schools the because they're, they're the of the subject. Sorry, Mr. Lyons. In some no, schools, not at all. Not in at terms all. of the columns, the number of columns being squeezed, yep. they have to drop them. That, that's the point that's being made by them. That's not the experience where, in some schools, where the subjects continue to grow. I take your point absolutely that nationally you can see that. But for me, that always comes down to the same thing. Can we get the curriculum right? Can we get learning and teaching right? And can young people see the relevance? So in some ways, you might see less young people doing the subjects, but those young people will be more motivated. They will see the relevance of it. And those that aren't have still learned at a level that will allow them to deliver what society yeah. needs from them in those areas. And I think that's really important. For, forgive me for saying so, no, Mr Lyons, but I, I, th I think the parents um, particularly feel very uneasy about that and therefore that's one of the reasons why there is concern for the point that uh, you raised regarding uh, our message. I think there is a genuine concern that the uh, choices of the core curriculum are being squeezed in schools and that this is a concern to employers, never mind to um, people within our, our education sector. Could, could I just finish my uh, questioning on the point? Would you... Abs I think there's a couple of folk who to respond to your okay, first fine. question, so could we fine. take them and then we'll Surely. come back. So, um, Tony McDade. Thank you. It, it was probably just a point about, whether, about the, the disconnect activity that you had said as well. Uh, you can understand about, if you think of the scale of the exercise, I think that that potentially is, is some reasoning behind that. If you're looking at um, an implementation of a, of, a, of a scale in which you're looking at, um, to implement the broad general education and then looking at changes to the national qualifications, inevitably people will want to make sure that the technical part of those courses, if you're moving into national qualifications, are correct. Lining up an S1 experience then into an S4 experience probably needs now an opportunity to reflect back. Now we've been able to settle it down. Now people know what a National 5 or a National 4 or indeed changes to higher looks like. You're then now going through the broad general education a number of times. You need to look at the quality of the learning experience, I think, and you need to see how, how progressive that learning experiences are. For example, in first year, if you're looking at inquiry skills and social studies, that those inquiry skills are the very inquiry skills that you need in higher, and that you're able to line those up together. And I think we're now in a position that we're able to do that. But I do take the point, and if people remember previously, 5 to 14, then young people would start their standard grades and then they're higher. It was quite a disconnect. So the learning that was taking place in the history class in first year didn't necessarily connect to the standard grade experience or indeed the higher when they were looking at different skills. What you now have a chance with here is lining that up together. So I do think there's a, a, there is an opportunity for not only greater progression, but probably a, a better coherence within the structures themselves. Sure. Can I make a couple of points here? Um, first of all, in relation to the broad general education, um, it's, it's important to say the local authority I come from um, has significant um, staffing issues, and that has an impact on broad general education because inevitably, when you don't have enough staff in the school, then the staff will be deferred to the national four or five um, senior phase classes. Um, secondly, um, Coming here today, um, I added a bit of analysis on exactly what you're saying, the subject um, uptake, um, and it's purely in entries, but it's on numbers uh, and also percentages. Um, and looking um, at the Aberdeenshire um, pers perspective, we don't see any downturn in the subjects that you mentioned. The philosophy of the broad general education is for 10 or 12 subjects to be delivered to an S3 stage where the youngster can potentially bank that information and the, 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 the stage that progressed in the subject to be picking up at a later stage, not a direct follow-on at S4. So that's the kind of philosophy of it. So if you took um, the, the other side of the argument where you were saying that the reduction in subject, um, the number of subjects uh, within S4 would directly impact the output and level of qualification, well, what we've looked at as um, the, the entries for subjects like French and like art and design, where um, it, it could be argued the point um, that you've just made. And if I just look at, for example, the National Five um, trend for um, French. So the young sisters selecting a National Five in Aberdeenshire and French went down from 2014 to 2018 to 408. 
However, the advanced hire and the higher figures would be shown to be up because in higher friends they increase from 189 entries to 248. And indeed, although the German went down, so indeed did Spanish. And again, if I look at the art and design, that figure increased from 212 to 239, which is an increase um, of 113%. Um, percent. So I think what these figures tell me about my own local authority is, although there, there is the issue that you describe at the beginning, that youngsters may discouraged, be discouraged from taking those subjects at the initial part of senior phase, when it is embraced in its totality, then it would appear that youngsters are not being disadvantaged and the subjects that they would be looking to take, there is, there is no apparent decrease in that, in that opportunity for them. Uh, on that point, Mr Doherty, when yeah. we were given evidence uh, back in 2013-14, uh, when some Aberdeenshire schools, I think I, more sort of a Boyne area, if I, my memory serves me correctly, there were a lot of parental concerns about, and bankery, I think, um, where parental concerns were pointing to the fact that there had been a squeeze on uh, the availability of subject choice. Could you just tell me exactly what the local authority has done to address that and to bring things back to what you've just described? Um, we have... Um, encourage the flexibility for head teachers. Now, again, I mean, as I mentioned in Aberdeenshire, the, from the south of Aberdeenshire, Bankery and Aboyne, the schools perform very differently from the doing Fraserburgh and Peterhead, etc. But we encourage the head teachers to have that flexibility to tailor your curriculum to best to the needs of the youngsters from the community that you're serving. So you will find that that there are a, a, a percentage of our young people who do do seven accredited qualification courses in fourth year from different areas. Um, but there would also be um, the, the, the encouragement for, we've got youngsters who um, are presented for higher courses in S4, for example, um, and advanced higher, so early presentation um, would be encouraged. But again, it's within the spirit of providing the, the right pathway for the individual youngster. And therefore, you know, you get trends within local communities. Um, and it's the flexibility that the totality of that curricul curriculum and the timetable and flexibility that gives you, that allows that, that um, opportunity to be given. And again, it's for the, the youngster at the correct stage. So the evidence I have for the local authority that, that I'm looking after is that this has now came through. So that initial question that a parent would have had, they're going to do, if they've only got six subjects, they're not going to do music and they're not going to do art and design because they're going to have to do the six subjects. They were looking to get them in, in fifth year to qualify for university. Well, that's not relevant. That's not the way that it should be. And what we're seeing is that that's feeding through. So it's about the exit qualification that youngsters are achieving. OK, thank you. OK. Um, Sorry. I wanted to add, which is a, a certificated course that's growing in the BGE, which is Modern Languages for Life and Work. I don't know if anyone's mentioned that to you. And again, it's, a, it's, it's something that Modern Languages embrace. And I think one of the real strengths at the moment is that Modern Languages are now realising, you know, we've got an issue here, we need to find ways to do it. And Modern Languages for Life and Work has mean that young people are coming to the end of their BGE with a, with a certificated course, with something that's accredited and which is focused on how they use that language in life and work. And it's just a part of the picture which I think is important to share. Thank you. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Yes, uh, good morning. I'd like to explore um, the issue of subject choice um, variation within a local authority area. Um, I think we all have uh, constituents who come to us complaining that their child can't take a particular subject, but two miles down the road in another school, they could. So is there an argument for a kind of local authority-wide policy on subject choice in, in the senior phase in S4? Yes. Mark. Uh, I mean, with, within East Renfrewshire, um, we have a, an approach where, um, as, as colleagues have been describing, the school um, will design their curriculum to meet the needs of their students. Um, broadly, um, across East Renfrewshire, students will um, select eight subjects, sometimes nine, in S3 as they blend the experiences and outcomes into the, the senior phase. Um, and in S5, they'll choose uh, generally five subjects um, and um, three or four in uh, S6. Um, 
but within that flexibility that the schools have, we also then operate within a sort of broad framework of agreed principles. And colleagues have mentioned that, that need to make sure that that cluster planning um, from 3 to 18 is very strong. That's been a, a key element for us. Um, and also um, for us, one of the key elements is that um, in the senior phase, the S5 and S6 uh, timetables are aligned so that if um, certain subjects are not available in a particular school, perhaps at advanced higher because of the size of the school and the scale, then they're able to uh, uh, access that in an, uh, another school. Is, is, just on that point, can I, I, mean, I don't know if you know how common that is. I don't think it's, that's happening in my local authority area. I'm not really talking so much about advanced hires, I'm talking about S4 uh, choice. Um, you know, that, that with the column structure, they just can't take one and they, they could take it another one down the road. And I, I don't know, sounds great what you're talking about, but I'm not sure that it's happening in my local authority area. Can I maybe just ask those who are representing uh -huh. local authorities just to each indicate what their position is? Yeah. Hey. The Glasgow position is that the communities in Glasgow are so diverse that each school, as Mark has described, has to design its curriculum to meet the needs of of this community that it serves. So, for example, you know, Holyrood and Hillhead serve a very different community from Castle Milk High School and St Margaret Mary's. So, to to have one approach would not be suitable in that. Con context. In terms of the consortium arrangements that, that Mark's talking about, uh, Glasgow has worked to bring the timetables together, particularly on a Tuesday and a Thursday afternoon when they're aligned so that young people can travel as appropriate. And certainly there is an understanding in Glasgow that young people uh, can be offered a wider range of opportunity for schools work together. So schools are very open to taking young people from different schools and courses that they're running, but you know other schools aren't running. That tends not to be a, a fourth year scenario. That tends to happen further down up in the senior phase and particularly in S6. Unfortunately, what you're describing has has been a scenario long before Curriculum for Excellence as well, that you know there's only at times so many subjects we can deliver and young people can't always get this individual subjects that they want, even though they were all on the table right at the start. But there's some timetabling issues that Vincent's discussed. But certainly the concept of being able to travel and being able to get a wider range through schools working together is, is a well-established practice in, in Glasgow. And I, I would imagine my colleagues are going to reflect that across all local authorities. You hear about what's happening in Angus? Um, so we're striking the balance between individual schools developing their own curriculum alongside we have eight secondary schools so the eight secondary schools getting the benefit of working together so like colleagues we have a common timetable across all eight secondary schools which we have developed in partnership with Dundee and Angus College um, through a strategic partnership arrangement that means that all our youngsters are going to the college courses on the same day across Angus and there has, there's staffing and practical benefits as well as benefits from the young people getting to meet each other from across Angus. So we're really trying to um, respond to community needs individually through the curriculum whilst benefiting from working together and really trying to capitalise on some partnerships with core employers in the region. So Brecon High would be an example of, we have developed in partnership with a local roofing business, a construction centre on the site of the secondary school that allows us to offer qualifications alongside um, an employer in partnership. Um, and it's, it's been really successful. So it's really trying to get the best of both worlds for us. South Lanarkshire? We um, have a We've worked quite closely with our schools about trying to develop a framework. It didn't make sense for us to have one uh, full curricular model. If you think we have some very rural schools and we've got very urban schools, so the notion of having a, a fully integrated model that you would set up for a college day, when in actual fact our college afternoon, when most young people who were in, in, in our rural areas were spending most time travelling, what we've tried to do is work with those schools to try to have the vocational offer on site as well. So if we take foundation apprenticeships, we have a, del a, a blended delivery model where we work with some of our local colleges, some training providers, and indeed we'll deliver those uh, foundation apprenticeships in our schools as well. So you've tried to get it. I think the only other thing I would say is there is a strong relationship between the, 
the broad general education and what's happening in that third year and the quality of that experience as it moves in. I, I do also think it is an experience that's based over fourth, fifth and sixth year. You can understand parents that are saying, do you know, I've in my school at six, well over here at seven. But I, th I think when the conversations are had at local community levels with the children and the families to talk about why that is the case, this is not just about your fourth year. You can do this when you, you can do another subject when you move into fifth year, or indeed what you're trying to get to. And I, th I think that conversation with a young person about their career and what they're trying to do, and that you can do that those qualifications across the full senior phase. I think that's an important conversation. And I think when you have that explanation at school level, it does help. But, but you can understand a natural anxiety for people if they're having a conversation between two different households that are serving two different communities. Back to the earlier point about communication, I think, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Communication should go beyond course booklets. You know, it should be about conversations. It should be about encouraging parents to come into the school. It should be about having conversations, not about the generality of it all, but about, you know, your child, your aspirations, your hopes, and how we can best meet them. And it's how we get to do that better and more regularly, which I think will lead to parents being more confident in what's happening in their schools. And Aberdeenshire? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just to say that in Aberdeenshire, the geography of Aberdeenshire makes those consortia arrangements just slightly more difficult. Um, but as, as Tony was saying, um, I, I think as uh, this has always been an issue. You know, as a head teacher, I remember that parents would come in and you would find, why can't my son do these five different choices? And it, it ends up the explanation of it is the question back, well, why would they be doing those five subjects? Can we explain just a wee bit more about that? But what I would say is in the last few years I have um, detected a distinct decrease in the volume of those conversations and it's definitely down to you know that that, that you could say that you know it's 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 being better understood the concept that because you can't get that subject at that point you know that doesn't mean you will not be able to study that that subject and as I say if you're banking these qualifications in third year then that's how it's set up you should be able to uptake that subject at any point throughout your your senior phase. Thank you. Can I just ask what authority or entitlement a parent has in that conversation, or the student? Mm -hmm. Because it's all very well having a conversation, but if the conversation starts with, no, you can't do this, and it concludes with, well, we've told you why we can't do it, that's not really a conversation. And I wonder, I mean, I reflect more on experience of a parent in that regard, but I wonder, and this, that predates Curriculum for Excellence, are you suggesting that we should have a model where, in fact, you can, you have an entitlement to push, or for that conversation to be something other than, you know, sorry, we can't help you with that. The, the phase I use all the time is learner journey planning. And if you take the, the, the senior phase as a three-year learner journey, you know, rather than saying to a parent that, you know, you can't do that, I think what we'd be more inclined to say, well, let's look at how we fit in everything that, you know, you want for your child in the three years that they're going to be with us. And I think that's a much better start to the conversation. Satisfactory conclusion if you still get to the point where um, it's not going to give you the options that you want, and we have that the empty column syndrome. Yeah. Sorry, what? You know, the empty column syndrome where people, they, there's a column where basically is yeah, no matter direct what. experience yeah. again, there's absolutely nothing in that column I want to do. I mean, I'd like to have done something else, I'm having to do that, and there's a kind of a constraint. I just, I'm just, I think, I wonder how honest we need to be with parents about what are the limits, of, and young people, the limits on their choices. Make a couple of really good points in there. Uh, one is about honesty, and that, that at times does, you do get to a point where you say, well, look, I, I've tried every different way that I can look at this for you, and at the moment, I just can't offer that. And we did offer, find ourselves in that situation occasionally, and that was a staffing issue very often, where we just couldn't run the subject. So that you're right, honesty is, is really, really important. More schools are looking at different models of timetabling now. Inevitably, you end up with columns, Tony and I, because you have to call them to get everyone into the timetable. But more schools are looking at starting that process with a free choice exercise, where you say to young people, based on your tracking, pick your, you know, pick your best subjects, based on your destination. I always said, start with your destination, pick the subjects you need, then the subjects you're best at, and then the subjects you enjoy. And you, that's the starting point for the discussion. I think that's a very positive starting point. 
and then the, con the columns are constructed from that basis rather than starting with the columns and everyone's got to fit in, which leads to empty column syndrome, which is a lovely phrase which I will now steal and use regularly across, Peter, across discussions. <laughs> and the more we engage parents right at the start about what we're able to do and why we're able to do it, the better chance we have of parents at times accepting something that perhaps they wouldn't have in the past. I presume we all agree that there's also a limit on free choice. Again, as a parent, there was a kind of a... <laughs> we don't want some, you know, the extent to which you're balancing what's in the interest of the young person with their, um, their choice. Can you just welcome um, Tavish Scott at this point? And I'll maybe ask Ian Gray to ask his questions. And I'll look back. So, uh, uh, um, we're talking a lot about um, course choice and, and the uh, options that are there. Um, maybe, I, I suppose, you could argue it's a bit of an oversimplification, but the core of the work we've undertaken in this report has been around subject choice at S4 and the number of uh, certificated courses that pupils can choose. And looking at the evidence, um, it's quite interesting that there seems to be a difference not only within school, between schools, but between authorities. So, for example, um, the evidence uh, from East Renfrewshire says that most uh, S4 pupils will study eight subjects. Um, some of the other uh, authorities, the evidence would seem to be that most of them, most schools, it would be six. And I just wondered w w why you've come to a different, a different position. Why is East Renfrewshire eight and the others are not? Certainly, the, the, it wasn't a local authority position that, that Glasgow came to. Uh, it was a school by school position. My own experience in the schools where I was head teacher was that I. I went to parents and I said to them, uh, in terms of the senior phase, the options we have available to us are the following. You can we, we do eight just now, is eight the right number? In St Andrews, 86% 80 of parents said, no, that's the wrong number, because of the eight, they're very good at six, or they really like six, and the other two they only did because they had to. They also felt five was also the wrong number because it was too narrow and we then came to six and seven. The, the number of subjects is not driven by a kind of, you know, here's what we're going to do. It's about engagement with the community to say what would best serve the needs of our young people across the three years of the senior phase and, and fourth year sits, sits in there. Aberdeenshire. Okay, um, thanks, Stuart. Um, again, in 2013, Aberdeenshire took the position to um, consult with schools, but, you know, basically to say um, that it will reduce, the column structure will reduce from eight to six subjects in the main. And I would have to say that, that overall, most youngsters in Aberdeenshire in fourth year um, have the option to do six subjects and then and then additionally. But I always think it's important remembering, you know, you're going from eight subjects, because remember, standard grade, that's a subject delivered over two years. And national five subjects are, are delivered over the one session. So it, it's a lot to do with the timing of the, the makeup of the courses as well. It's really important to bear that in mind. That, well, let me come back to that point. But sorry, let's hear from the others. Uh -huh. um, with, within East Renfrewshire, we, we did look at um, moving away from um, broadly eight subjects in, in uh, fourth year um, as a, a group of head teachers and um, with the senior uh, team at the centre, we actually looked at sort of alternative timetable models and looked to see, and we could we could do those. But um, I, th I think as a group, um, looking at the sort of we had a, a series of criteria that we'd work through um, that had originally been introduced by HMI around 2005, and uh, essentially I think the group felt that it was in um, having listened to parents and to the pupils. Uh, and to the staff that, that they didn't feel the case had been made and that actually they wanted to protect uh, the structure that they had. So it, it did come down to saying this was what they felt was in the, the best interests of, of their pupils. Um, and so they, we've, we've broadly struck with the, the eight. And now that is a, a flexible. Um, so we'll have some youngsters that will, like I say, in, in some cases do a ninth subject. They can pick up PE uh, and we'll have some that will do fewer where it's not appropriate. So I was speaking to a head teacher yesterday in advance of this meeting who was talking about a couple of youngsters that he had in his, his school in fourth year that um, 
compete at a very senior level in terms of athletics and uh, football. And they have a, a, a bespoke timetable, again, to make sure that it is meeting their needs. So it, people aren't forced through uh, a particular model, but uh, overall, it was felt that uh, it met the needs uh, of our learners. And it did. From a South Lancashire perspective, it's predominantly six or seven subjects. There are a couple of schools that will look at eight. The conversation, though, for us was about what was happening within the context of the broad general education and that transition year of S3. What was the quality within that eight curricular areas that were covered? And then, importantly, with the, with the subjects that were un, being undertaken in S4, and, and again, I can understand why there's a conversation that's focused on S4, but were those young people able to look at S5 and 6, pick up their hires, other national qualifications, and also importantly, other forms of qualification as well, that we weren't being a slave to one particular model, and if we were able to do that, that schools weren't just going to look at that S4 experience in isolation, that you really then needed to look at the journey of that young person as he moved into fifth year and, and indeed sixth year, or importantly, what, what was the quality of their experience if they were a fourth year leaver? And I, and I think that that's a crucial point to that as well. Lauren Stephen. Thank you. In Angus, it's usually six subjects in S4, and that came about after um, building the curriculum three, I think, when we were translating national policy into what we were going to do locally and engagement with people at the time. The eight secondary head teachers at the time came to the agreement that they felt that they would wish a model working together and um, six was um, felt to best meet the needs of our um, context. Um, we've had some recent discussions with our parent council chairs around about whether that still feels like it meets our, the needs of our young people. The general feedback from that discussion was yes, but it's something that I think over time we will continue to review and explore. Okay. If I can paraphrase the pan panel's responses, um, most of you spoke to parents to see what they wanted. Um, in um, Angus, you thought you were implementing national policy and came to six. In East Rand, speaking to parents, you ended up at eight. Everywhere else, it was six. You, perhaps you can understand why the committee feel this is quite hard to, to understand. It's difficult to understand why parents in Renfrewshire, East Rand, should feel so much more strongly than in Aberdeenshire or, or whatever. I mean, the other element of this um, surely is the relationship of S4, not just to S5 and 6, but to S3. So, for example, um, Dr Ratter, you said earlier on that your students do a certain number of courses in S, choose a number of courses in S3 and then take some of them on through S4. You're really working on a 2 plus 2 plus 2 model, aren't you? That's why you're able to do 8. That's why, why your pupils can take 8 subjects, isn't it? S certainly in terms of the... Um I mean, our, our, our head teachers and our schools look at making sure that we've got an up, we, we talk about an appropriate grading of learning that goes right the way through from three through to 18. So all seven secondary schools uh, plan very closely with their cluster colleagues in primary uh, and early years to make sure there is that curricular continuity. So we've got, if I give for an example, in, in uh, reading, 90% uh, of learners will have achieved the second level by the time they start. Uh, in S1, and it is about making sure that they then build and they have those progressive learning experiences. But in terms of that S3, it's crucial that that is still um, based around the principles you would expect for a broad general education. And we actually did a review a couple of years ago, um, spoke to a large number of pupils. Uh, we had 700 responses in terms of questionnaires, uh, staff involved to make sure that that was about uh, a distinct experience from the fourth year experience, that it wasn't a case of uh, focusing on examinations in S3, but it was allowing the learners to lead their learning, to take forward digital learning, um, uh, taking forward in terms of developing the young workforce. So, but we, we do recognise and, and make sure that the, the learning that takes place in, in S3 is part of that continuum that then enables them to achieve success in, in S4. So, in other words, and this is not a criticism because East Rand's results, if you, as you've just said, are very, very good. Um, you, you are essentially delivering uh, those certificated courses which are sat in S4 across S3 and S4 because the S3 learning is at a level which uh, S3 is, not right? So, you're really delivering them over two years. And, and that, that's why 
your pupils can Some of that you? learning, uh, I mean, it was alluded to the, um, the Education Scotland paper that was produced in 2016 that looked at what that uh, progression from broad general education into the senior phase should look like, and we very much make sure that we take on board that, that learning and that that is part of that uh, progressive nature in that way. So my question to Mr Doherty is, you, you, you described something similar, Mr Doherty. You said that the learning in S3 must be of a quality which allows it to be banked in order to contribute to further learning in that topic further on. So why can't your pupils use that to essentially do NAT4, NAT5 courses across two years and complete eight of them in S4 in the same way as East Rand does? Because our attainment pattern just now is showing that and the, the core of attainment is continuing to improve. However, and I think you mentioned earlier on about, you know, this is becoming more complex. It's a much, much more complex world. And, you know, the future is going to be even more complex. So in terms of preparing youngsters for a world to go into that is uncertain, you know, it's inevitably going to be that there's going to have to be this increasingly complex mixtures of experiences and skills and qualifications. And I think that's best delivered through the model that, that, that Curriculum for Excellence has identified. And that's a model where you would make sure the entitlement, and we're all talking about entitlement in broad general education, that's really the trick for this. It's the key that if that's really strongly delivered, and I'm saying from S1 to S3, it's, it's well beyond that. If the youngster has between 10 and 12 subjects and covering all areas that they have to cover, that the progression can go on, not just to S4, but can be picked up at later stages during the senior phase, then what I'm saying is in relation to National Progression Awards and Foundation Apprenticeships and, and other um, measures of qualification that youngsters can get, as well as those youngsters, because we find in Aberdeenshire that the youngsters who are going to get five hires and go to university, they are still continuing to do that. And that's our pupils that I mentioned before in Bankery and Aboyne. That continues to happen. But this now serves a much, in a much more equitable way, a much bigger range of the population. The world isn't any more complicated in East Renfrewshire than it is in Aber Aberdeenshire. Are, are, are you suggesting then that in East Renfrewshire the approach that's been taken is less equitable? Why can their pupils complete successfully eight subjects in S4, but in Aberdeenshire that's not appropriate? OK, and I will mention this because you mentioned about the attainment profiles. Now, it, it may be, and this whole thing's about being contextually specific. Contextually specific for youngsters who move into schools on about East Renfrewshire to do exactly that. That attainment profile and that educational experience must fit their aspirations and aspirations of their parents. And I'm saying it's, that would be similar for areas of Aberdeenshire, like Bankery and, and Aboyne. However, in you know, the geography within Aberdeenshire, there is a, 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 a bigger um, totality to be. In Bankery and so on, they should be able to follow a similar model, but they don't. I've said that in Bankery, and because uh, I mentioned them twice, Bankery and, and uh, Aboyne, you would find that pupils in Bankery and, and Aboyne in Aberdeenshire do more qualifications in S4, which is perfectly correct, and so they should, and would maybe be more suited to what Mark's explained um, to us there. So there is that variety. But my point is that that variety and flexibility is, is more able to be catered for within the senior phase and broad general education setup that we have within Curriculum for Excellence. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian, I wanted to say something. Thank you. I also think the conversation should be looking at the, the journey of that, that young person in fourth year over fourth and fifth year and indeed into sixth year as well because the notion and we haven't really cracked this and I know that that's been part of some of your conversations as well about the young person that may bypass that qualification in National 5. I think there is merit but, but parents are understandably reluctant at the moment and we've not convinced them that taking away that assessment burden will be in their best interests. I think you then need to be quite robust in how you monitor and track. If, if you think about some young people, you double the time you'll have their pace in learning. So I think there are pros and cons. So for some, you need to have the flexibility of the one-year activity, or indeed it's completely appropriate for some young person to take away the National Five, because you can see them as they come in, they are higher candidates. And we need to just to try to be as flexible as possible. We've not probably cracked that bit. I think I, I, would, add, I would add to that as well that 
uh, you, know, you know, the journey to the highest possible level is what it's about, rather than the different stages along the way, which is eight and fourth year and whatever and fifth year. The other area that we've not really explored as much is, you know, I think it would be really interesting to explore is also the, to what extent can young people be presented for hire at the end of fourth year in areas where they're particularly able, you know, and, and music would be an obvious example of that, where young people are, you know, playing music at a very, very high level and could pass the higher music <laughs> very young, but wait until the end of fifth year to do it. And I think those are the kind of flexibilities that are really interesting to explore. Two-year hire programmes, you know, young people do not eight national fives, but, you know, eight courses, some of which are at higher and fourth year, if they have the ability. But really importantly, that parents are engaged in that, that there's robust tracking and wanting to make sure that progress is right and that the pace of learning is, is at the highest possible level. Alistair Allen. Thank you very much, uh, Kadir. Um, we've heard in, in evidence uh, in previous sessions about the, uh, the mixed economy, if you like, that there is in terms of the influences that there are on the curriculum and the structure of the curriculum uh, in different uh, parts of the country, but uh, obviously there's the role of the SQA that there has been in shaping the senior phase. Uh, we've heard from Education Scotland and others. Um, I just wonder if any of you could say anything about your take on uh, that mixture of influences on the curriculum, whether you feel there's a case for more or less intervention. I think we have a collective responsibility. I, I think that you can't ignore the, the wishes of a community or a, or a school and working very closely with schools themselves. And the, the role, I think, for us at a local authority level is to provide that support and direction, to try to make sure that those schools are well supported. There is, of course, a difference between... And this is probably why you see schools taking one step at a time. They're very conscious of the responsibilities around young people. That, but we're in a position in which we can try to provide that support and direction. We try to work closely with the national agencies as well to make sure that they're on board, that they will give us the national picture. They will be able to give us you know, direction from an international perspective as well. But I do, I do think there's a collective responsibility for all of us to look at that. I, mean, I, would share that. I, mean, I think as an education community, we have to meet the needs of young people. But you know, the most important driver is, you know, where are young people going to go when they leave school? What is their destination going to be? How do we get them to the highest possible level? And then we all have to work together to find ways of doing that. And to me, that's the influence. You know, what are young people telling us? What are parents telling us? What are destinations telling us? And let's drive everything towards it. And Tony's absolutely right. All the agencies have to work together. All the people have to work together and keep young people right at the heart of this. And I think if we do that, the influences are what they are, but we're still focused on the right thing. OK. I, I would just add to my colleagues um, that I agree, and I think curriculum is a collective responsibility, and I think our conversations need to also include the quality of the learning experience. So as well as focusing on the what of the curriculum, I think it would be helpful to have those conversations, debate like we're having now about the, the, the how. How do children learn? How do young people learn? What kind of learning is going to support them to have the critical thinking, creativity, all the skills that they're going to require in a changing world? And I think together, all of the agencies involved can bring something to that conversation. Thank you. Uh, related perhaps to that, uh, uh, and it certainly relates to the point that was made earlier on by Jerry Lyons about the job of work that, that is ongoing to, to explain to parents uh, the choices that there are. Uh, is there more than can be said about what practically might be done to improve that conversation or assist that conversation? And also relating to points that were made earlier on uh, around flexibility, whether, whether parents understand that not only uh, is there uh, a variety between schools, but there might op actually be flexibility within schools when it comes to choices. Yeah. I, I do think there's, there, there, there are some good opportunities when you look at the, the practical examples of the learner journey. Again, possibly one point is the, the way in which schools have engaged with local businesses and indeed universities and colleges to show that there can be complete flexibility in how a young person may end up in a first year university course. It might, have, it might very well have been embarking on National Four qualifications and wider achievement, building the profile as they move along. 
into from the school, but indeed making the college making a contextual offer. I, I think of Strathclyde University Engineering Academy, or I look at Glasgow University widening participation. So I think it's it's convincing our parent body that it is okay to, to do something different and then giving very practical examples of what that looks like. For the young person it may very well be the traditional they've gone in the traditional subject route straight into university and moved on into their pathway. I think for some others that, that journey is very different now. But I think I think universities, colleges and employers are better. We, there, there's still a bit to go. But I, I think that trying to give some of those very practical examples about the, the differences of that journey is important. One of the best uh, pieces of work that I've seen emerge in, in this area is describing young people's learner journeys. And I, you know, I was looking at some of the schools in Glasgow and in other schools and other local authorities where they've taken a young person and said, you know, this was what their destination was but this was the route that they took in our school to get there. And then getting young people along to parents' information evenings to say, this was my learner journey. And we, in St Andrews, we had a great experience where we brought different, we three different pathways and we brought a young person from each pathway to tell the story of this was my journey through the senior phase. And it was great to hear parents come, parents come out and say, that boy that spoke, that's my boy and I now know what he needs. So I think young people can tell this story for us really well. I think taking individual learner journey stories, there was a bit of work that was done a few years ago by Education Scotland where it was kind of notional. Now it's not, now it's real. Now we can tell real stories to say, there's a young person who came through a school and got to the destination that way. There's a, a different young person who got to the same destination, which is what, and went a completely different way. I think we can pull that together in all kinds of ways to tell individual learner journey stories. And I think parents get that. And I think that would be a really positive thing for us all to pull together and make that widely available. Dorota? No, I, I mean, absolutely, I would, I would echo that. And I, I, mean, I think there's a responsibility on all of us in the system. Uh, and certainly one of the things that we've found that has been uh, effective is that partnership with Skills Development Scotland, and their sort of careers advisors and coaches and that starting as early as possible. So are those discussions starting in S1, looking at and bringing together those learner pathways along with uh, that sort of future uh, planning for what young people would like to do post-school and making sure then in terms of those discussions along with parents that along the way at the various milestones they've got the information that they need and I think that would along with those individual pupils uh, complements it very well. Uh, the, these conversations that we're talking about that take place between schools and, and parents, indeed young people, don't take place in a, a vacuum. They take place in an environment that's partially informed by what's in, in the, the public domain and what's going on in the media. Uh, we as a committee just yesterday received evidence from, from COSLA, from their uh, children and young people spokesperson Stephen McCabe, who said that uh, young people could be at the centre of a debate overly focused on political considerations rather than building on the many strengths of the system that we have. Discuss. <laughs> One side of A4. It is challenging, that debate, isn't it? When, if, if you're looking, when we were speaking to our schools and they see the tangible improvement for some of those young people, if we think of some of our fourth year leavers that were potentially heading into negative destinations, that now have got a training provider, that now because of the flexibility within the curriculum that's offered to them, that journey has been changed for those young people. I know there's been lots of conversation on that. All of our young people are important to us, but those young people are particularly important to us because we know that they're leaving the, at its earliest point and some of their traditional destinations have been poor for us. So I, I think that conversation is, cha is challenging for us. I think it sometimes can have a negative impact on, on our schools, the feeling of uncertainty that, that that creates across the system. The thing I would say is that it would be helpful to build in and recognise some of the particular strengths that are going on within it is now, so that we're not always potentially... Of course, we need to look at improving. But we also need to look at the things that are going well and to try to capitalise on the things that are going well. One of, one of the things I think is I found frustrating in, in my you know, time as both as head teacher and now in local authority is the, the negativity at times that appears in our press around our, 
education system and who generates that, I'm not altogether sure. But there's really fantastic work going on in our schools and there's really fantastic things happening for young people and we need to get that story out because while I'm the same as Tony, there are things we can do better. You guys have picked up on some of that and I think that's really important. But the backdrop of discussion about how do we do things better should be look at all the things we are doing really well. And I think you're part of this community as well and we're, we're uh, part of the community together. Let's do that together. Tell the positive story of what we are doing and use that as a springboard for the things that we could do better so that we could do even better for our young people and for our country. Tavish Scott. Apologies for lateness, convener. It's, uh, it's not every day I get a primary school from Shetland down uh, in Parliament, so I was showing them around. Um, and they had a lot of questions they'd ask you guys, but I'll, I'll resist that because um, I might be accused of Alistair of uh, being political. Um, I was actually going to ask about the senior phase and the definition of the senior phase, because last week in evidence, Larry Flanagan of the EIS said that he couldn't put his finger on what the senior phase was actually for, and, and that worried him as the, as the leader of the biggest teaching union in Scotland. And if he can't, then I'm not sure who can. So you're all uh, senior practitioners in this game. Can you define the senior phase for me and what you're trying to do? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that what was happening was to build... It's a progressive curriculum from 3 to 18 that was to build on the, the benefit of a broad general education that then specialised and picked up some qualifications for young people as well, build on their skills, talents and abilities that they've had from 3 to 15 and absolutely try to make sure that those young people are then focused to the destination that they needed. Uh, for me, there's an entitlement, which is very clearly stated, that the senior phase should be the phase of education where young people uh, gain qualifications and continue to develop the four capacities. So there's an entitlement within Curriculum for Excellence. It's in all the Curriculum for Excellence documentation. That was a driver of the senior phase, and by my understanding of it, the second driver of the senior phase was that young people have the right to support into a positive and sustained destination, and the senior phase is about that. And the last thing for me is that the senior phase allowing for uh, developing the young workforce, you know, becoming part of this discussion is as much as possible to get flexible pathways for young people so that they can gain those qualifications, develop those four capacities and gain those positive destinations. That for me is what the senior phase is about. Okay. For me, it would be that the two key words are specialisation and choice because it's when the youngsters would reach that, that sufficiently mature stage where they would have that entitlement for the specialisation and choice, and that's where the accreditation and the gaining of qualifications come in. So I think that's quite clear. Well, I mean, I, I would uh, agree with the, the comments that um, my colleagues have made. Um, for us, it is about continuing that, that opportunity to develop, um, as Jerry was saying, those four capacities particularly in fifth and sixth year, given um, youngsters uh, opportunities in terms of leadership um, to develop their skills, build their confidence, uh, along with their further achievements uh, and that portfolio of qualifications that will allow them to progress to, leave a, uh, to a positive leave a destination. Okay. Um, I won't repeat anything that's already been said, but I'll say and... For me, there's a bit about, in, in the same way that S1 in a secondary school should feel different to primary school, for me, senior phase should feel different to broad general education for all the reasons that my colleagues have described. Well, thank you for that. You made my point. That was a whole range of different things. There's a whole range of different answers. I mean, there's a layer. Well, you're all waving your hands now. You've, you've all just given your answers. You, uh, you, you've, you've given a range of answers. Uh, what we were taught... Just a minute, just a minute. I'll try the, I'll try the question. I'm the teacher here, so you can hold on a minute here, Jerry. Um, the... Uh, uh, the uh, what Larry Fla <laughs> no, no kidding. Uh, what Larry Flanagan was saying is, uh, in the context of advice, is about, it relates to Alistair's first, Alistair Alistair's first question about the agencies, um, that the clarity that I guess you'd expect, that we'd all expect from the system, isn't uh, there from the senior advisor to the government, which is Education Scotland. That's the part I'm interested in. I mean, I, you've all set out, I think, very compelling arguments as to what your senior phase is trying to do, but can you show me where that is set out in a coherent form for the whole Scottish education system? So all 32 senior leaders of education in 32 local authorities know exactly what's expected of them. Do you think that exists? Because Larry Flanagan didn't. Where, where I found everything was in the building the curriculum documents. That's where I found all my guidance. Uh, 
that to be one of the most difficult exercises that we looked at. Is that right? When we looked at implementing the curriculum and the implementation group, I don't know if any of you sat on that, it yeah. was not coloured in success. Yeah. Nine years of going round and round in circles. Listen, we, I, I don't think a, we, we do ourselves any favours by denying that some things weren't as clear as they could have been. I think where we sit now is that you can hear five colleagues from local authorities describing for you in slightly different terms, slightly different nuances, but fundamentally that we're all trying to do the same thing in the senior phase. Our understanding of that continues to grow, it continues to evolve. And again, as Tony made the point, I think it's up to the education community to work together in order for that to become clearer for everyone, in that, and I include yourselves in that. But certainly I think the understanding of the senior phase is pretty clear. And I, and I, I know I saw what Larry said, uh, but for me, I think there's a, a clarity about what we're trying to do now, and it's grown through practice and through discussion and through working together to get there. At local authority level, would that be fair to In say? In a whole range of ways, across local authorities, mm -hmm. schools working together across local authorities, uh, local authorities working together a whole range of ways, and Education Scotland have been an important part of discussions that I've had on, on and growing my understanding of some of that uh, through, through the journey that I've had to get to understanding. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about um, equity and um, justice in this question, because I understand that a school doesn't have so many young people who make five hires. Um, another school, in fact, you've said to yourself, well, look, those who are going to get five hires are going to get them anyway. But surely part of the exercise must be about understanding why young people in a disadvantaged community are not able to actually achieve their full potential. Because you've already said you're shifting the resource elsewhere. So I want to start, first of all, with multi-level um, teaching in classes. Larry Flanagan said last week there was an explosion in multi-level teaching. So I'm interested what analysis you've done at your authority level on the scale of it, whether in fact it has increased, and where are you more likely to be if you're in multi-level classes? So... Yeah. Um, in, in terms of our, ourselves, the, the, the evidence has been there, there was, has always been some degree of multi-level teaching. Um, whether that be in the senior phase, if you're, if you're looking at um, some subjects are designed in terms of its outcomes, that, um, that there are some of the practical subjects where it's, it's more straightforward. That might be asked the latter part, the last part of your question. And inevitably, there are some compromises, practical compromises around some of our smaller schools. That, that's in, if you have a school of 600 as opposed to a school of 1,200, there are some things that are different. And that itself is rural and urban, or is it within urban settings? No, this for us is rural. Right, okay. It's a rural setting. So, that, so that there's, a, there's, there's an understanding around that? Okay. Yeah, it's a rural setting for South Lanarkshire. Um, our urban schools are, are larger than our, than our rural schools. I think also the, the approach and the methodology of, of multi-level teaching has been there. I th there are... Some that will find, I think if you're asking teachers, and I know the evidence that some teachers will find that a bit more of a challenge, I think inevitably if you're teaching a multi-level, sometimes a multi-level can happen during the course of a year, not just at the start of a year. If you're thinking about a young person embarking on a course of, a, of higher who doesn't necessarily have that National 5 qualification, but is potentially struggling with the qualification, will stay in the class continue to do the work and potentially be presented at a National 5. I think that's OK. I think that's not quite the starting out as an N4, N5 higher and advanced higher group, I think that could be much more challenging. I think it's more, it, it lends, some subjects lend themselves more than others. I think if it's very content or knowledge driven, I think that can be more challenging, um, especially if that content is different. However, the other thing I would say is sometimes the quality of the group dynamic or the learning experiences of those young people can also kick in as well. And many teachers want to solve those issues for young people. If two young people are coming to an advanced hire and saying, I'd like to go into that class, teachers in schools try to be very practical. Can, can I clarify what, you, what, we're, what we mean by multi-level? Is it about different levels of courses, National 5 higher in the same room, or young people in 4th, 5th and 6th year? We've been told in some circumstances, National 4, 5s, okay. higher and advanced higher in the same class. So it's about levels. And age as well. Yeah. 
So, so, so it's about levels primarily and, and that you're phrase, concerned I mean, with? I mean, what I'm really trying to establish with you, are you aware the EIS is saying there's been an explosion? And what I'm trying to establish whether it's, well, it's a rural school is a bit more difficult, or has it become the norm, head teachers have the permission to do that and flee up other bits of the curriculum? So that's the first thing I'm interested in. But the second one is, is it disproportionately in disadvantaged schools? And how can that possibly sit in, in any notion of equity and fairness? Okay. Uh, so the, the first thing I would say is that, you know, bi-level teaching and multi-level teaching started actually with higher still. And, you know, once a... Uh, you know, higher and intermediate two were uh, together and, and people started to look and say, can they both be taught in the same uh, classroom? My, my experience of bi-level teaching in Glasgow, if I can talk about Glasgow primarily, is that it's not something that we look to do, but it's, some, it's something that we can do to extend pupil choice and to give young people more opportunities. Some courses lend themselves more to it than others. And one of the things that was highlighted as we were going into senior phase course development was that, that some of the higher and intermediate two courses did not articulate well together. So can we create courses that do articulate well so that where, where necessary, a uh, bi-level teaching could take place and no disadvantage to young people? And a lot of subjects did that. Not all subjects did and one of my things would be that we should look and see, let's make sure that courses articulate so that where we have to have bi-level classes, then we can deliver them. Multi-level, not and just bi-level. Multi-level. Multi-level, I would suggest, is through necessity rather than choice. So it's timetable time time yeah. driven and resource driven? Uh, not necessarily time, yes, to some extent. What I suppose what I mean is, I don't think any of us would say we would look to have multi-level classes at all, but sometimes, Tony talks about rurality, sometimes in small schools. Glasgow, the issue is it's about small schools, not deprived schools. Some and of these small schools are small schools because of what they offer? No, they're small schools because of the communities they serve. Well, Southern them, High School would be well, an obvious example. It's chicken and egg, isn't it? Castlemilk High, St Margaret Mary's are relatively small schools. One might have argued in the past that young people have gone from those schools because of a bigger op series of options for them in other schools. Certainly, uh, the recent inspection of Castle Milk High would suggest that's not the case. Right. They've just been had a very, very positive inspection. And one of the things that was rated very highly in that inspection was the range of opportunity that was offered to young people within that school in Castle Milk. So, bi-level teaching is something that, I don't, if we could possibly avoid it, I would suggest we would prefer to. But where courses work well together, it can work very well where they don't articulate, then that's where we I have to look at the courses or look at how we organise classes so that young people are not disadvantaged by that. And would there be an equality impact assessment done by your local authority if we were able to establish that disproportionately there was multi-level classes in disadvantaged schools? I would, would be... Would you direct resource? Yeah, yeah. You would, so you would... One of the things was suggested by... EIS uh, the last meeting was that we maybe look at a model around the old model of areas of priority treatment. You wouldn't necessarily use that, that term. And I, of course, I should say I recognise absolutely there is fantastic work going on in schools, um, you know, like Casme, other places that people might have, you know, the, where there's they're really serious work being done there. I'm not denigrating that. I'm wondering if they deserve more support if you're talking about. Um, getting a level playing field around what it feels like to be in a senior phase um, in terms of, of what your classes look like? I think two things I would say. The, the issue for me, and, and certainly looking across Glasgow, is about size of school and what you're able to offer. And bi-level teaching is, is a way, multi-level, as, as you've, you've referenced as well, is a way of increasing that offer. Uh, so that's about size of school. I don't think it's an issue of deprivation. The second point, I suppose, is if you're offering more support and more staffing and more resource, yes, thank you very much. I'll have that. Sadly, it's not within my gift, but I'm wondering if actually, I mean, a serious question, that if, if the, the curriculum is managing disadvantage yep. and could in, there's a danger of amplifying it, when in fact what you could do, even within, within the resource you've got, there's a, an equality impact assessment argument which says you direct more resource in, in, into those schools. 
outcomes in Glasgow have improved significantly at all levels mm -hmm. across our city in the curriculum for excellence era. That, to me, is the measure of what we're doing, and that tells me that what we are doing is improving things for young people, improving things for young people in poverty. Recently confirmed in our inspection around the Scottish Attainment Challenge that we were improving young people in poverty. So whatever way we are going about doing that, we are having a very, very positive effect on the lives of young people and the outcomes that are part of those lives. Okay, but more resource would be... Assistance. Well, I, I don't think ever any education professional will sit in front of you and say that more resource would not be in assistance. Okay. I don't know. Could, yeah. could I maybe just mention that certainly an Aberdeen perspective, um, I, I, we've not detected any explosion in by or tri level um, teaching. But I do have to say, from what we were discussing before, it, it's potentially one of the pay, the, you know, the, the, the price, if you like, for the flexibility that can be created um, within the timetable. However, I, I, I would say that the most difficult places for us to do that in our current context would be the schools with the highest levels of deprivation. So therefore, it, it would not be um, in the design to plan by tri level class and within there. What I can say is in terms of the attainment from the, the, the inevitable increase that has happened um, there is there's no discernible downturn in terms of the, the, the attainment of the young people within those classes. In these disadvantaged communities wanted to go up the way and I'm just wondering, you know, Professor Scott has um, given, I think, com quite compelling evidence that the most disadvantaged are more disadvantaged still. And I think that is obviously something we want to interrogate and I'm just interested in I suppose my, my, my final point, and maybe you can come back to the committee later on, is what work has been done to monitor that kind of offer across different schools. But I hear what people say, it's not just cert certificate driven, but if your school's already disadvantaged in terms of the number of qualifications that are coming out of your school, then it, it actually does matter in terms of closing the attainment gap for them. I, I, I would only say about that from the, and speaking on behalf of Glasgow, the evidence of Glasgow and the performance of Glasgow totally contradicts what Professor Scott said about that. And that, for me, is, what, is how I measure the effectiveness of what we're doing with the curriculum and, in fact, all aspects of the work of our schools. I think the idea about an equality impact assessment is a really useful one for any policy change that we're thinking of. I think it's a really important lens in which to consider change. And I think looking at certificated courses and offer in that way would be helpful. It would also be good to include other types of courses that are available. So for some schools where there are fewer hires than there were previously on offer, there are other qualifications that are on offer through partnerships with the college, partnerships with the university. So it would be useful to explore them all in the round. OK, thanks very much. Yep. Only just to say that, you know, to agree with what you're saying there about that focus needing to be on equity. Uh, I mean, all the local authorities were very much, um, you know, it's that excellence and the equity within East Renfrewshire. We talk about raising the bar for all and closing the gap. Um, and certainly, in terms of Professor Scott's evidence, it wasn't from our, my own authority's point of view something that I recognised we would have strong evidence both in terms of the broad general education, in terms of CFE attainment and teachers' professional judgments along with uh, taking perhaps lever uh, attainment, uh, looking at a range of different measures that uh, when we look at that from key equity groups that we're seeing that closing of the gap. Okay, thank you very much. Gordon MacDonald. Um, most of the questions I was going to ask have been touched upon, but one thing I did want to ask, we talked quite a lot about the senior phase, excuse me, and, and given that um, we now have had a number of cohorts of young people that have been through the senior phase, is there anything you would change in the senior phase in order that we can better serve our young people? I mentioned that the notion where we can expand the offer of young people not necessarily sitting a full range of qualifications in fourth year where their ability allows them to do that. I think some of it was about reducing the assessment burden and the assessment burden for those young people 
whether it be fourth, fifth and sixth year, allowing them to recognise that wider experience and, that, and developing those skills that are crucially important as they move into the workplace or indeed into university. So the one thing I would say is, is for us to try to look at that, those models that are working, to try to give schools confidence that they can do that, and also to give our, our, our school communities reassurance, because it is uncertain for a, for a family of, of a young person starting out in fourth year thinking, I'm going to miss out the national, qual national five qualification, when in fact it's a bit of a false conversation when that young person has the capability in order to do it. So that's probably one of the aspects I would look at. Uh, I, I, would echo, I would echo what Tony said and add in that, you know, that flexibility in terms of when young people can be presented and you know, at a time when they're most able, most ready and uh, when's best for them. So I think I would want that. I would love to take the phrase alternative pathways out of the whole thing. Uh, let's just talk about learner journeys for young people, not alternative pathways, because that suggests, if you're on an alternative pathway, it suggests because you couldn't be on the proper pathway. So for me, taking away alternative pathways and also removing the phrase extracurricular, because nothing's extracurricular. Let's make sure we celebrate learning, not just in classes, fantastic work going on in schools in all kinds of ways and making that part of the picture as well would be something that I would certainly want to highlight so that the achievements of young people in the round are recognised. Anybody else? No? Yep. I suppose it goes back to one of the points that was made earlier about um, uh, I suppose continuing to be ambitious and, and looking back and thinking about ways at which we would continue to change it. So um, last year our secondary heads engaged actually with the paper that, that Jerry had written about his curriculum in St Andrews and we uh, invited uh, one of the head teachers from Glasgow that had completely changed their curriculum model because it was about continuing to look at what the evidence is telling us what our results are showing, are we making a difference in terms of that equity, what can we learn from other schools where, as you were saying, we're now further in that senior phase journey. So I suppose it's, it's not necessary that would particularly change it, but there would be that, that constant review and looking to see where is there headroom for improvement still. Alternative pathways, and we'll try and avoid using that uh, <laughs> topic, but obviously schools got a lot of partnerships with colleges these days and there's vocational courses, foundation apprenticeships and so on. So what is the take up in your area of these vocational courses and the uh, foundation apprentices, etc.? And how do we get the um, message across to parents and employers that these are equally as important qualifications as NAT4, NAT5, NAT6, etc.? Totally. The uptake. Certainly, the uptake in terms of school college partnership in Glasgow is, is high and growing. And one of the things that we are doing as part of our employability strategy is working with our colleges to say how can we extend the offer, and how can we give more opportunity in different ways. Uh, foundation apprenticeships as part of that. I think that uh, again, it's a growing picture, and I think we're. We're trying to understand better how we can offer foundation apprenticeships. Tony talked about in-school offers. One of the things that I hadn't, you know that way you didn't think about things, that parents heard the word foundation in apprenticeships and thought it was like foundation standard grade and therefore there is something about communication. So it's a growing picture. It's something we're recognising as more positive uh, and we want to explore what the headroom is, but certainly growing. I think the point you pick up is, is a really good one, and I think it's come from your evidence, which is we need to tell that story to parents better and stronger and get the message out that this is not something you do if you can't do other things. This is something you do because it's what's best for your, young, your child and which will lead to the destination. I think we've got more and more, case law is not the right word, but more and more examples and precedents, and it's using them in discussions with parents so that they understand all the models and they understand that they're all important and not one's alternative, which is only for people who can't do anything else. So I still think it's just about pulling all that together. Pauline? Thank you. My own view is that a really good and effective senior phase isn't offered by a school alone. It's offered by a school in partnership with lots of people. A very important partner in that is the college. 
We're in a place in Angus where after the summer we will be moving to hosting a foundation apprenticeship in each of our eight secondary schools delivered by college staff from Dundee and Angus College. Now that has come about as a result of good relationships, good partnership working and a really shared view to improve outcomes for youngsters. And I think when all partners can get something really meaningful out of that together and it becomes core delivery. So in our course booklets, it's gone out with that information about foundation apprenticeships. I think that's really helpful for families to consider at home. Although I go back to, we've got an ongoing communication there to do because when I speak to young people about, as I do, you know, where are you going and what are you leaving to? And um, I spoke to a young man who was going to join an accountancy firm to get his qualifications. And the hardest people to convince that that was the right thing for him were his parents. Um, and th what the school did in that case was support him with the pros and cons of different routes and support him to have that conversation at home. So I think there is ongoing work to do around about that. I was just going to say, you asked them um, the question about if there's anything you would do differently. And, and for me, it certainly would be, and that's been you know, echoed in my colleagues' responses there, it would be, it's not selling, it's explaining to parents you know, what this whole thing was going to mean for, for um, the, the young people. Because it, certainly in the foundation apprenticeships, which in Aberdeenshire, we've, we've really moved that on you know, for the right reasons. You know, and it's definitely going to be the most appropriate thing for a much bigger number of young people in the future. But the biggest barrier that we've encountered is that explanation to the parents. And it's like, am I taking a gamble with my son or daughter's education here? And, you know, I'm just unsure. Can you show me more? Can you tell me more? And at the earliest stage, you know, I think the explanation and the clear understanding we know, you know, holds barred in terms of any preferences, just that explanation to the parents, you know, and I think I would have done that differently in terms of senior phase and, and as a proposition. The best examples as well, if you take some of the work-based learning activity, if you take foundation apprenticeships as an example of that, then young people are moving into, if for them if it's appropriate, moving into real employment opportunities as well. That they're moving into real jobs that give them pay and an opportunity. That it's not just some kind of esoteric activity. That it really does translate. You take early learning and childcare as an example of that. That if a young person is doing a foundation apprenticeship and is the thing they're really interested in, there are some really tremendous opportunities for them now. That it moves into a modern apprenticeship that then gets them to become an early years worker. Those are, the, those are the kinds of things that will convince people that it's not just something that I'm doing. Well, it's great to be doing it because it's good. And indeed, in some respects, some young person may decide it's not the pathway and they'll develop general skills. But there needs to continue to be a sharp focus that young people going into, employability, in, into employment that comes from some of these courses as well. OK. OK, thank you um, very much. Um, I think we've come to the um, end of our panel session. And thank you all very much for attending. If there's anything you want to follow up on in terms of what you, you yourself said or any other evidence you think would be useful to the committee, we'd be delighted um, to receive that from you. So with that, can I thank you again. And that concludes the public session for this week. And next week's meeting, we'll be taking evidence from the SQA on this inquiry and considering some subordinate legislation in early years childcare. And I'm going to suspend for a few minutes before we move into private session. But thank you very much again.